Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to today's Kent Seminar Lecture. Today, we are very proud to have Dr. Anjali Jamie as our speaker. Dr. Jamie is a research scientist at the Illinois Center for Transportation at UIUC. In January 2025, she will be joining Arizona State University as an assistant professor in the School of Sustainable Engineering and the Built Environment. Her research focuses on tire pavement interaction, pavement mechanics, damage quantification, and energy harvesting. She holds a bachelor's from University of Nevada, Reno, and a master's and PhD from Illinois Oil and Civil Engineering. She is vice chair of the Highway Pavement Committee in ASCE's Transportation and Development Institute and a core member of Illinois Autonomous and Connected Track Initiative at ICE. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Anjali. All right, I hope the mic is great. Okay. Thank you everyone for this opportunity um, in sharing our current project right now, funded by IDAT, um, R27252, dealing with the impact of commercial electric vehicles on flexible pavement performance. I'll be remiss not to first acknowledge the incredible team that we have. Dr. Jaime Hernandez, who's an assistant professor at Marquette University, Uthman Muhammad Ali, uh, an ICT, and then including Professor Imad al Kadi, Johan Cardenas, Maryam Hafiz, who really are the engines of, of this work or the working grad students. Uh -huh. Maybe I need to click. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so before I dive into um, the results that we got and what are some of our preliminary findings, I want to at least motivate us, why are we even doing this? And so uh, this data may be old, it was only projected up to 2023. So maybe there's some data that have projected since we're nearing the end of 2024. But um, key things that you're, I'm highlighting here, these first group of uh, histograms that you see are heavy duty trucks, medium duty trucks, medium duty van, cargo van, yard tractor, and all of this data pertains to the electric vehicle industry in the United States. And the quick synopsis that we will get is there's a, clear projection and increase and the medium duty will be the highest because these are the trucks that are traveling regionally um, on top of the Amazon vans that you see that they've partnered with Rivian. But our main demand that's really driving our pavement design are the heavy duty trucks. So we'll focus on this. But again, as you can see, whether through uh, the contour plots that you see on, on the right or the histogram, there's a clear demand and that's going to be upcoming on our pavement infrastructure. And on top of that, apart from the demand in our infrastructure, the associated resources from the private industry will also increase because manufacturing to supply this demand will be high, um, OEM needs, and also maybe potentially retrofitting current um, trucks and vehicles instead of creating brand new electric vehicles. Okay, um, so that's from the private industry side. On the other side, which are the public agency who are uh, really managing our network, the, the USDOT being our lead. Um, they also have the uh, National uh, Electric Vehicle Infrastructure um, Program, the NEVI, which you might have heard. And as you can see in this mapping, the idea is they're now um, guiding and providing funding throughout the United States. And, and you see the different states here where uh, the states will uh, submit and uh, be approved for which part of their uh, highway system will be a corridor ready for EVs and the ones that are submitted as corridor pending. So again, now, apart from the vehicles coming, the demand is here that we saw in the previous plot. There's also uh, now preparation from the federal agency of identifying which part of our highway system will be corridor ready for said vehicles. So uh, two prongs on, on that side. And then focusing in Illinois, uh, just, to, just to highlight, um, and particularly where this project is done, we see that demand is, is also uh, clearly motivated from the federal uh, plan of uh, making sure that we have the right infrastructure should those vehicles um, uh, be in 100% uh, market penetration rate. And within Illinois, uh, it's been reported a little bit old, three years uh, data that we are fourth in EV deployment concentration. And it's no surprise that California is highest, but um, the point that I'm, uh, I'm making here is the fact that we have the demand from the vehicles, we have the demand from, from the program with the federal, but also within the state, we're inching towards more EV deployment um, in, in the future. And on top of that, some incentives at the federal 
and the state um, level with the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, rebates and charging, and even the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity here in Illinois also provides uh, tax credits for EV, the component, charging, station, and so forth. So again, I'm trying to pose this picture that there's a private industry coming with the vehicles. There's a national level demand or preparation for, for the infrastructure, but then with the local or state, um, uh, what I mean local in, in terms of the state itself, there are also credits to help us get there and transition um, really nicely through through the incentives. And um, in 2022, IDOT's EV infrastructure plan, deployment plan was submitted to uh, USDOT, uh, akin to other states who have done um, the same. And also on top of that, we have to think that these vehicles are not only traveling point A to point B within the state, but point A from to point B past the state. So uh, currently uh, a regional EV Midwest plan is also being worked out because we need to support um, that need and demand and the associated infrastructure that needs to support such demand. However, we know, and maybe this is a repeat for what you have heard about electric trucks um, and particularly heavy duty electric truck is um, there's, or even if you own a, a personal car that there's a fear in the short range offerings, right? Like once your battery finishes, what do you do in traveling? It needs to be uh, supplied akin to when we see gas stations at every so uh, miles, but now we don't have all the infrastructure necessary to make sure that that short range fear is, is abated, um, which is the second bullet point of lack of en route charging infrastructure. The cost whenever there's new technology that's introduced is, is there. Um, questions of how to properly prepare the batteries, what type of materials are we going to raw, how is it getting, getting recycled. So really lots of questions in establishing technology and the associated supply chain supporting each and every step of the production of the vehicle and also the infrastructure that's, that's necessary. Um, and then to uh, escalate that, not just the heavy duty, if you remember the plots that we saw, the medium um, duty and also the van, there's gonna be an increase because again, um, many of us are shopping um, uh, online. So to supply that demand, then we'll have to also um, uh, account for different vehicles of school buses, garbage trucks and delivery trucks. Uh, Amazon, I'm sure many of us order through there um, to support such need. And so led us to the project. Um, as a pavement engineer, now the main question that I wanted to ask us is, we are anticipating these heavy duty electric trucks to come. What do we do? So first questions that we were thinking were, is are the current roadways that we have good enough? And if they are, that's great. And if they're not, what should be changed in terms of the structural design to make sure that we're prepared uh, to service these new load demands? And so the scope includes uh, identifying where the battery placement will be. So now the truck um, load will be redistributed. And on top of that, um, electric vehicles can actually reach uh, a speed three times faster than uh, internal combustion engine vehicle or, or um, conventional. And you can think of that and relate it to where you're, when you're stopping or accelerating in an intersection, right? That increased shear may induce loads um, shearing loads. And so because electric trucks can get there faster, question is, should we now think about how shearing may happen at different points of um, our highway where this, this access to acceleration can just be um, easily reached? Um, and on top of that, we are considering four representative structural uh, pavements within the state of Illinois guided by the TRP. Because again, we wanted to make sure this study is as meaningful and helpful for them. And um, as the last uh, part of this project, we're also quantifying the economic and environmental impacts of the scenarios at hand, all the way to considering the um, uh, resource or the grid resource for the electricity that's needed for, for the vehicles. And so some people, Zhao and Gao, have quantified that if electric trucks were introduced, that the uh, environmental um, impacts will be lowered. You can see here that the uh, reduction uh, that was estimated uh, last year could be up to 86% compared to uh, diesel powered trucks and associated energy savings could be 29 to 44%. However, this I've pointed out earlier, um, but another study have uh, also clearly identified that, wait a minute, it's great that these are gonna benefit our environment um, and so forth, but the associated challenges needs to be mitigated and addressed prior to us just jumping in and, making, uh, and, and agreeing that this is great for the environment. 
And that includes the limitation of technology, the travel range, which we um, uh, mentioned, the payload constraints, because the, uh, the battery weight may be heavy. And so if you increase the battery packs, you can travel longer, but then you're removing payload from the trucking industry, which is not really, um, uh, it, it's an adverse effect because now you're removing the load from what they can travel from point A to point B. So now they're still under design of how to properly uh, do this economy of scale of scaling this in different location. And again, um, limited to the travel ranges, the availability of charging stations to make sure that their current routing that they're doing, say, across um, the country is still serviced should they change um, setup from a fuel into an electric vehicle. And then we also wanted to check how uh, literature have quantified uh, the impact of EV, and in this case, without torque for now. Um, John Harvey from UC Davis in 2020 had a study that the additional weight of 2000, and it was limited to 2000 because there's a limit um, of uh, what a truck can carry, right? We can't just increase it for the sake of increasing and having battery. There's a physical limit to what um, the maximum uh, load that uh, a truck can carry on our roadways. They assumed the same maximum axle load. However, they don't. They didn't consider the longitudinal contact stresses when they found that there's a minimal increase in pavement damage. Um, Zhao in 2023 utilized Ashto uh, where pavement ME utilizing the transfer functions. And I'll go back to this point a little bit um, later in the presentation, but what they quantified is with the extra battery weight and their um, IR projections, it, it changed it minimally. Uh, but I will, again, I will go back to this because there are some um, uh, details that we added to make sure that uh, that there's there's actually a change, but in this process that they followed conventionally of using Ash to wear me, um, it's indeed correct. And now, if I were to even scale back of the material response, hot mix asphalt, what will how will it respond when there's an increase in torque? And I gave that example of acceleration or deceleration at an um, intersection where we typically see those shoving and rutting, and those are um, evident um, response when you're shearing a material and that material has a low um, uh, uh, affinity to respond against that uh, shearing load. And some of the considerations that can lead to that on a, on, a, on a mixture level is maybe your binder content is too high, your fine aggregates is too high. Instead of having good angular stone-to-stone -stone contact, you have round aggregates, it's, which is allowing that shearing motion. Um, or maybe you have high density mixes with low SMA. And again, the idea is we know that under shear, the material will behave this way. And so when I have an electric vehicle that's going to apply that load, um, there's some truth to that material and to the structural response under this new load that's electric vehicles. Um, also, key findings both from testing and accelerated pavement testing and um, simulations that have been uh, done in the past. If you remember, I pointed out that the Harvey study um, nice study, but did it include longitudinal stresses? But some of the key findings um, based on our research group, but also from other studies that there's actually an impact when you have relatively high longitudinal pavement con uh, contact stresses when you do braking. And when I mean traction, it's just acceleration. And predominantly that is happening at the near surface uh, pavement damage. And when I mean near surface, that's typically within two to four inches from the top um, of the pavement. And with this high shear strain, as, as a function of the acceleration or deceleration, this can even be um, compounded much more when you're at a slope, right? Um, which, which makes sense because you're trying to overcome that gravity, trying to tra uh, travel in that slope. And what uh, was reported is this increased torque at braking at a slope can even increase running three to four times. So again, some truths of how this material behave, but now we're changing the ball game of the problem with heavy duty electric vehicles with increased load and their access to acceleration. The question is with this combined condition, what should we do? And what we did was, okay, we know that uh, the, the, the maximum estimate of the um, battery will be nine kips following the maximum load we can put in the truck. And just focusing on the cab. So you have the steer and the drive axle, um, conventionally a fully loaded truck you have 26% in the front and 75, 74% um, on, the, on the two axles uh, on the drive. Following that, once the fuel, the engine of a internal combustion is removed, we follow that same um, load distribution on the steer and the drive axles. 
And now we considered three locations of batteries. Um, this is not reported yet. It's still very much under uh, design in the OEM perspective. And so for the three scenarios, this is really extreme. I think um, Steve Garmia is one of our TRP members um, who's more uh, have expertise in this um, realm uh, pointed out that this may be an extreme scenario of putting the battery here, but um, at least it was it was a good extreme for us to consider. Um, or another scenario is putting it uh, at the back of the drive axle. Uh, and then the third scenario, as you can see, is evenly distributed. So we have a steering um, heavy where the um, battery is distributed only in the drive axle and then fully distributed along the entire cab. Um, uh, of what you see here. And I will disclaim that this only assumes that the battery is placed on the cab versus if a truck were to carry batteries on the trailer that gets hooked up at the back of the cab. So again, first three scenarios, three different locations. Question is what will happen? And just pointing this out that um, from this re redistribution, we selected uh, a single uh, one of the axles because now we will um, utilize this location as as the driving uh, load input for our finite element model to generate the contact stresses. And so with the contact stresses, we have two things that we're trying to account for. The battery location, which we just went over, three different ones which redistributed the load. And on top of that, the acceleration of those individual axles. So the key questions that we had were, um, in, in doing so, how will they these groupings of our load condition impact our payment responses? Um, when it's placed at the steer and dual tire due to the placement, um, what's gonna happen? And when you increase the level of acceleration, um, I'm just introducing, but will not uh, pay heavy attention. Slip ratio is just one of the um, inputs in the tire model to account for increasing level of, of acceleration. And also comparison, if you have ICEV or EV or heavy duty uh, electric vehicle, HDEV under the same load and speed, how, how do they compare? And to do so, um, uh, Dr. Hernandez spearheaded this part of the work where um, just a quick breakdown of how we did it in, in our uh, tire pavement modeling. And I will disclose that this model has been validated and calibrated previously. So a little bit of uh, fidelity that we can move forward and utilize this for, um, for, for, for the problem at hand. So this is the cross section of a dual tire assembly. You see five ribs. The second step is revolving that to create a uh, three-dimensional um, uh, tire, as you can see here. And then the third step is just rolling it um, at a desired speed, loading, and so forth, um, and traction if it's acceleration, braking, and, and whatnot. And this is just a quick view of uh, in reference of we just assume a rigid um, surface uh, and have our hyperelastic uh, deformable tire traveling. And again, the main output is there's going to be a contact stresses um, uh, where, where that contact of um, uh, surface and the, the tire would be. And so a quick synopsis, what did we find from the contact stresses we generated as a function of changing the load on the steer and the, do and, and the drive axle and changing the um, acceleration rates and, and so forth. So just a quick introduction. Um, we are looking at the steer um, tire, so the front one. Uh, we are increasing the load from 7.5 to 9.5. These values are uh, not pulled out of hat. If you remember, it was as a function of that load distribution that we um, considered. And a quick introduction of the plot. In this violin plot, the idea is you see the range of values um, for this load case. And the idea is the bulb of this violin, the wider it is, the more values belong to that uh, to, to, in this case, that contact load. So what we can see for the vertical force, when you increase the load, not a surprise, you're gonna have a higher magnitude. But given that you have um, a finite um, contact area, right? the bulb, the highest for 7.5, it used to be bigger, but it narrows down because it's simply getting redistributed at a higher magnitude. So that's why it's narrowing down here because it's getting redistributed to a significantly higher um, magnitude contrast to the 7.5 case. We also see that that increase in load also affects our longitudinal contact stresses where increasing in the positive and negative direction just means we're uh, increasing the magnitude. And the reason longitudinal contact stresses have a positive and negative side, if you think of a tire traveling, there's an entrance and exit. 
So that entrance part is actually compressing the pavement and at the back part, it's intention because the tire is pulling out of the contact to travel. So that's why we have a positive and negative side. And then what you can see here for the transverse force, um, there's not a lot of change. This one has a negative and positive side because along the transverse uh, direction, uh, when you push a rubber down, it's pushing outward, right? So that's why there's one pushing to the left and one pushing to the right, simply on that direction. But uh, but as you can see here, there's marginal change, but clearly um, for the steer, increasing it by two kips influence the vertical and also longitudinal um, force distribution. Now for the dual tire load, the change in load wasn't as severe. Again, um, it may be odd that we're only increasing by 0.5, but this was an outcome of redistributing the load at the steer, drive axle only, and then fully distributed along those axles. And what we see here is uh, uh, not as much, but a slight bigger change in the longitudinal contact stresses or contact forces when you increase uh, the load and really marginal impact on the on the vertical and also on the on the transverse. But this is also expected simply because we're simply increasing by 0.5 gips. Now with a slip ratio, again, uh, I should have changed the term slip ratio to acceleration to make it more clear. But again, what we're seeing here is I'm keeping the load. So th this is the dual tire assembly at 4.2 kips um, for each of these uh, uh, vertical values but uh, I'm changing it from free rolling condition, increasing acceleration and further uh, increasing it from left to right. And what we can see when you holding that load, but you're increasing the acceleration, there's an increase uh, in your magnitude for your vertical uh, contact forces. And again, similar to what we saw before, uh, the bulb is narrowing down from left to right simply because we were redistributing that into a higher magnitude. Now, the nice thing that we're able to capture is a high impact on the longitudinal. I will disclose that the longitudinal, if you see the magnitude, it's uh, up to 20%. So it's not as high as vertical, but it's um, prevalent enough that if you increase the acceleration, that negative to positive distribution of that entrance and exit is now moving more towards positive because of that high impact of accelerating um, uh, the tire. And then, uh, a slight reduction in the um, transverse forces. And what you see here, it's, it's getting closer to zero because it's, uh, it's getting, uh, the length of, of the violin ply is getting longer. But the main point here is as we increase acceleration, vertical is increasing a little bit, but highest impact on our longitudinal shear forces. So now we have some contact stresses ready to um, appreciate that increasing acceleration for a heavy duty electric truck will increase your longitudinal um, contact stresses. And so final remarks on uh, the contract uh, force distribution. Um, I, we were happy to have captured the larger torque in HD view, which we just saw in the result using finite element modeling. And in general, um, quick synopsis, tire load, and in general load in tire modeling or even uh, pavement responses always governs. What, what I mean is the impact of load tends to be um, highest, but as you can see here with increase in tire load, highest impact on the vertical um, contacts as the forces and acceleration, um, it's slightly increased for vertical and slightly decreased for transverse, but a high impact, which we just saw in the violin plot for the longitudinal forces. And then um, considering zero slip ratio, meaning free rolling, um, we were also able to um, uh, see or witness in our results that the reaction torque for our HDEV was three times higher than ICEV, which is in line with what's been found in, in literature. And so what do we do with this nice um, contact stress um, database, right? We go back to the project scope, which is understanding the impact of heavy duty electric vehicles on pavement. So now let's go back uh, to, to um, understanding how, how this impacts pavement. So a quick uh, preface and uh, another finite element model that we use um, for pavements now. So we moved on from the tire. What we conventionally do is uh, assume any payment structure of interest, and that could be like a layered system. There's friction in between and so forth. The associated material properties, uh, vis linear viscoelasticity for, for AC, maybe stress dependence for the, your base or granular um, layer or even subgrade, if that's appropriate, associated environment, and then the loading, which we just got from the previous task of generating contact stresses. And what we do is we include all these inputs 
we run our simulation and this is kind of a nice gif of how um, the, a, pay, a sample pavement structure will, will behave under the loading condition, which you see at the top. For the sake of this framework, we are just showcasing that we're relating this to pavement design at the HMA at the AC bottom, mainly because IDOT being the sponsor, one of our goals is also uh, to recommend a way to incorporate this into their design framework. And currently what's governing their pavement design is the HMA um, strain of the AC bottom, but we'll see in the analysis later on, but that we also expanded to other responses, uh, different directionality and, and behavior throughout the pavement. And so a quick introduction on, on, on the, uh, the model itself. So from the left-hand side, this contour that we nicely showcase is actually um, an output from our pavement, uh, sorry, for, from a type pavement model that we, we just did. So that becomes an input into our type model, which I introduced. And some key features also is we're incorporating uh, the dynamic analysis. I've mentioned the material characterization, layer um, interaction, and then a continuous moving load, um, in this case, from left uh, to right towards you, um, uh, just to simulate uh, that, that lag impact for viscoelastic materials. And so recapping, here's our load conditions where we had three redistributed battery locations. I've mentioned um, earlier on that uh, we selected four pavement sections, and these were um, taking the, the recommendations from the technical uh, research panel uh, as part of this IDOT project, because again, we, want, we could have simulated any pavements of interest that we wanted but we wanted it to be as representative to what they have. Because again, if you remember, my first question was, will the current roadways that we have in Illinois be good enough? And if they are, that's great. So we made sure that we represented the not only the layer configuration, which we went through um, uh, several plans and iterations with the TRP, but also representative material characterization. So even the materials we considered were representative of what's used in IDOT uh, from top to bottom. And so breaking down the loading cases, um, I know this is a little bit busy and we won't, I, you won't have to remember everything, but what I'm just pointing out is um, uh, the P1 and P2 column are our ICEV case, which is our internal um, combustion engine vehicle. And then we have four loading conditions for our electric vehicle. Um, couple analysis categories that we were, we were able to loop is one, um, change in loading for both the steer load and the dual tire, but also the slip ratio increase for uh, the medium uh, load for the steer from zero to three percent, and also slip ratio increase. And that just simply means I'm no acceleration, has acceleration. This is for the dual tire and also comparison of the vehicle itself. Again, the green one is internal combustion, and then the red one is uh, uh, heavy duty electric vehicle. Again, just a quick synopsis of what we group, but it's okay that you don't remember uh, this table um, that, that I'm showing. So what did we find? Um, the top row are your typical, uh, we, we coined it typical thick, but you can see here, this is um, six inches of um, HMA where you have a surface intermediate and leveling binder. You have a 12 inch base on top of the sub, subgrade. And then the second, the bottom row is a low volume road. And here you have um, three and a quarter uh, or three and a half. Yeah, three and a quarter um, HMA uh, full layer with a surface layer on top of leveling, eight inch base, six inch sub base on top of the subgrade. And again, these were guided by our TRP. So what were our key findings? Um, I should also introduce the, the x-axis. AC, AC, um, epsilon AC11 is your longitudinal um, uh, strains or tensile strain uh, at the bottom of the AC. Um, EAC23 is your shear strain at near surface. And again, when I say near surface, it's within two to three inches from the surface. E13AC, another shear is also near surface, but longitudinal. So it's a direct manifestation of that longitudinal shear and contact stresses and the associated response from the pavement. And then the last one is your subgrade vertical strain. And mainly what's used in conventional pavement design is tensile strain at the bottom of the AC and also uh, vertical um, compressive strain on top of the subgrade, but we included the shear because this is also this is a shear problem. So we're trying to identify. Um, and what we found is um, when we have this is dual tire assembly, conventional internal combustion, dual tire assembly, electric vehicle, um, and as you can see here, increase in load um, that 0.5 kips. If you remember the violent plot, 
And then uh, the S values here, the steer where we increase it from six to seven. And in general, from green to red, which is there's an increase in load, we see that there's an increase in responses. Again, the, there's no surprise. And um, similarly for the low volume road, that increase is also uh, manifested higher magnitude because now we have more deflection for that um, uh, low volume road, uh, AC layer is happening and also there's less thickness to um, uh, really mitigate that load transfer. And that's why the subgrade is also much higher for uh, low volume than the typical thick, as you can see on the right side. Um, now, comparing here for these responses in these uh, structures, what you can see is when I'm increasing my slip ratio, meaning I'm introducing no acceleration with acceleration, um, there's marginal change um, in, in all these responses, specifically only for these uh, thinner uh, um, HMA layered uh, structures. The story is a little bit different when you have a thicker um, uh, HMA. So here it's a total of uh, 10 inches. You have a two inch SMA on top of an eight inch uh, dense grade HMA, um, 12, lime, 12 inch lime modified soil type of subgrade, which is your full depth pavement. And another consideration we have is this is an SMA overlay section. Actually, this is the section that ICT has right now outside that's about due for testing uh, for accelerated um, pavement testing soon. And what they have in that section is two inch SMA on top of two inch leveling binder on top of a 10 inch um, CRCP or PCC on top of um, the subgrade. Now with either a thicker layer or four inch SMA on top of a very rigid um, support, what you can see here is um, the shear is very predominant, which we have also observed um, in the field where near surface is highly influential for thick pavements. And especially when you change the acceleration rate, if you remember before, it was marginal change between the other two structures, but now it's significantly higher. And again, this one three is that corresponding shear that's really responding, if you may, to that increased acceleration rate uh, longitudinally. And that it was also found similarly when you have your overlay on top of your PCC where your longitudinal shear strain is also significantly higher. So this now goes back to what were found at the material realm that when you have increased in shear, um, and especially with this structure, that there's an impact in your longitudinal shear. And in our pavement design, these shear values are not conventionally used. And so in the next uh, few sets of slides, I'm gonna introduce um, the way we've incorporated this shoving um, uh, scenario, if you may, uh, through the use of mechan the mechanistic empirical uh, design guide. And just a quick um, preface, maybe you've never heard of it. And if you have, that, just the idea is now I'm going to use that critical pavement response, in this case, the strain, input it into a transfer functional equation. So then I can estimate how many number of repetitions can I withstand prior to failure. And you can do so um, for different distresses. Um, and what's conventionally used with bottom of fatigue cracking is at the bottom of uh, the HMA layer, your tensile strain, to quantify bottom of fatigue cracking. And then for HMA rutting, it's uh, the strains along, uh, uh, permanent strains uh, along the uh, vertical direction to add that rutting uh, value. Now, um, what we did to incorporate the vertical shear strain and also the longitudinal shear strain is borrowing the top-down fatigue cracking um, transfer function to input the uh, shear strain. And since shoving is most closely related to rutting, we also borrow the HMA rutting um, approach, but instead we're inputting the longitudinal shear strain. Um, and we know that this may not be uh, the most accurate, but it's the most relatable. And uh, at the end of the day, these transfer functions were heavily tested. At this point, we weren't comfortable to create a transfer function to represent um, the right phenomenon, but at least at this point, we're borrowing. We know that it's uh, not the most accurate, but at least it will give us some intuition of what could happen when there's a replacement of, of using that longitudinal shear strain to induce shoving, which is also like in the world of rutting. And so um, in doing so, just a quick um, introduction we all, of, of the metrics that we use. We also quantified well, what is the relative distress when I'm comparing uh, the internal combustion engine, which will be our reference case, and with our uh, um, whatever case of interest, it could be the heavy duty electric truck with different loading conditions and also um, changing acceleration rate. 
And mainly this is just telling us that with respect to say a specific distress for an individual axle load, that's how much more um, number of repetitions uh, or how less of a number of repetitions it, it can sustain compared to the reference case. And, but what we know is pavements don't behave or don't do not um, fail under one uh, mechanism. And so what we did is we combined these distress ratio into a cumulative or a weighted combination of distresses. Because if you um, can foresee, maybe the number of repetitions that will happen as a function of bottom up will be different in running and different in shoving. And so we applied a logarithmic um, weighting scheme um, to have a single metric per axle of incorporating the bottom up, top down cracking due to vertical shear strain, um, HMA vertical running, and also that longitudinal shear strain as a uh, as a representation of, of shoving. But this is analysis is only done for a single axle. But at the end of the day, we're it's a full truck that's traveling on our roadways. And so um, borrowing uh, Miner's Law, what we did is um, we have a, an effective number of repetitions of failure um, uh, um, per, per, per truck. And then we combined, um, again, each of those distresses to have one, a single representation for the full truck with different distresses was the intent. Mm -hmm. And so, Jumping now, I know we don't have all the time to describe all the details, but I thought, um, what does what did all those equations mean? And so one of the things that we also need to provide for our life cycle cost analysis is an IRI progression. And trusting all the um, ratios and math that we did, um, what we utilized that uh, full truck representation of number of repetitions to failures is a service line. Because at the end of the day, what we wanted to quantify is if I have um, an electric vehicle, which is the green, um, where the load was put in the drive axle, so the two axles at the back of the steer tire or even spread, what is the reduction in service life relative to a internal combustion um, engine? So that's kind of where we uh, utilize that uh, full truck, number of repetitions representation that has bottom up, top down, um, shoving and also running is to, and we know that IRI is an all-inclusive metric for all of those distresses. So we utilize that to identify that there's this reduction. I will say that we're still at this preliminary stage. So this is just a, a dummy um, uh, IRI data. And our plan is to actually utilize actual IRI measurements and then perform this service life reduction. And uh, to be uh, share with you, we just received actually the IRI data today. So this is super fresh, but this is just a, a dummy data to, to showcase what we have in mind. And remember the equation, again, not have to remember, it's just what, what I want to present um, towards the end of this presentation is what we're proposing as a, as a framework. So remember that we went through quantifying the contact stresses. Now we're computing the tensile strains. We also wanted to check that the shear stress along the um, interface, um, we're still within the shear stress limit because if it's not, then we need to redesign um, that interface condition because it's not good enough. And if it is, then if you remember, we were uh, calculating the number of repetitions of failure, getting the distress ratio all the way to computing the logarithmic weight. So we're not just simply doing a geometric mean of the number of repetitions because it will fail at different rates. And taking that cumulative ratio for a full truck and our our next step that we will be testing is utilizing that distress ratio as an input into the IDOT pavement design and their traffic factor. And then going through their design um, uh, uh, framework of uh, go penalizing the design strain and then um, outputting the uh, HMA thickness um, depending on how the traffic factor um, is changing. And I will disclaim that, you know, one can ask, well, then what you're telling me is I can only change the thickness when there's dif different loading conditions. And you're absolutely right, because that's the um, uh, extent of the, the framework. And so one other thing that we're doing as our fund simulations is we'll be actually changing material property to realize how it's changing in this framework, because currently the design itself is only allowing the change of thickness. But we realize that a solution may be changing the materials instead of the thickness. So we will be comparing uh, those scenarios. But again, this is uh, quite still under development, and we'll be happy to share as, as we get the results towards the end of the project. Um, and then also currently uh, under works right now, which will utilize the IRA data that we just got today is doing a life cycle assessment, um, going through these different uh, um, game points and 
um, particularly the output of the LCA cost uh, will be reflective of the payment responses, number of repetitions, right? How the payments were impacted with ICEV or heavy duty electric trucks with um, acceleration and change of load, but also we will be accounting for um, uh, um, where the resource in terms of the grid um, for serving that electricity for, for the heavy duty um, electric trucks. But again, this is still under work and we'll be um, uh, very happy to share the results once we get. And then just a quick introduction of um, the scope here, just a, a uh, quick showcase, but again, we'll we'll share the results once they are ready. So uh, what are the main takeaways from today's um, seminar? Um, not a surprise, but we were glad to also um, see that our responses, our, our payment simulations were able to represent as is expected. Load is king in responses that when you increase the load, the responses must increase. That's a check. And that was found across all payment layers. And that should be the case. Now, what we also found is when we consider the same applied load and slip ratio slash acceleration, that the tensile strain at the bottom of the AC were similar. And maybe that's okay because what you're changing in your contact stresses are your longitudinal contact stresses, and those are highly influential at near surface. What's influential towards uh, deeper into the pavement is your vertical load. So this is, there's no change in load, there wouldn't be any change towards the bottom, but towards the near surface, um, there were change. And which is what this point is saying, further compounding with acceleration, we saw the near surface region and specifically the shear strain um, was impacted and maybe this shearing may warrant increase in maintenance and rehab, which we saw from that um, sample IRI, right? The, the triggering time for your EV case is earlier. So then your frequency at a given analysis period will be more, you'll have to do it earlier than your conventional um, uh, truck condition. Um, last but not the least, just acknowledging really an incredible uh, TRP uh, team that we have that's spearheaded by John Sanger. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for your attention and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Anthony, uh, for the nice presentation. I was just curious to ask, did you try um, simulating deceleration because mm -hmm. I I've seen some papers that say acceleration deceleration are different. Maybe deceleration has more effect on shear. Yeah, short answer: we did not. Um, mainly because our matrix was kind of full, right? Because whenever you add another parameter, it compounds. But we did what we did. So one notion is maybe deceleration is the same as acceleration, and we did a check at the beginning. It's actually to your point, it is not. Um, so maybe that's a second phase as to identifying that condition or even a slope behavior. Um, Cause you're absolutely right. They're, they're not the same. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I had one more question, which is related to, I was just interested in understanding your uh, explanation of when having better layers like SMA, when having thicker layers, we are seeing more effect mm -hmm. of electric vehicles like so I, I would like to understand it in some way sure so a thinner layer if you load it it's going to be bending right yes but the thicker layer won't be bending so that influence of shear is going to be dominant at, at the surface because of that lack of um uh deformation yeah and that's also found not only in our simulation, but also in the field. It has been measured that uh, near surface um, strains are evident um, within two to four layers um, of, of a thicker pavement um, layer. But in the thin thinner layer, you don't see shear as dominant because the bottom is dominant because of that um, deformation uh, bending scenario. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Yep. I don't know if it makes sense, but uh, you're not expecting to have uh, an acceleration from zero to a very yep, high speed yep, yep. in the interstate. Right? Yep. So uh, uh, how is like that play in any, play in any important role in your research? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. If we were to think of um, where your free flow speed, right? Maybe it's only for a few in between where you have to either slam your brakes for safety or you have to accelerate because someone is cutting you off. But then we can think of scenarios where those trucks are leaving the distribution centers um, or merging into um, the highway, right? Where there's 
a lot more length where this could be um, realized. But you're right. If if you're just traveling on that free flow fee speed on a highway, this will be less. But it's those more critical scenarios where uh, these trucks are going back to get charged or leaving because they just got charged and delivering and then on and off ramps uh, uh, could be also um, uh, locations where you have to slow down because you're turning and so forth. And to follow up on Lama and Kamal's question, if we know that deceleration imposes way more torque than acceleration could, uh, that means our areas of interest are now limited to mostly intersections where you have to like either slam on the brakes or slam on the gas, right? Mm -hmm. And that's that. And to Hanan's question about the interstate, if we have, let's say, 100% of our fleet as EVs that now weigh 89,000 pounds, uh, driving over the interstate and there's no basically concern for acceleration or shear anymore. Does this mean that we have to turn this problem into uh, seeing what the effect of EVs is going to be on fatigue over the long term, rather than just look at it from a shear perspective or slippage or yeah. stuff like that? I'm going to answer this two ways. If we're allowed to increase the load, then fatigue will start governing, right? Because that load is governing that fatigue. But all these answers I've told you is under the premise of the current driver's behavior. Will that be true later when there's either a dedicated lane or even autonomous vehicles where you no longer worry about that stopping side distance to be safe, um, which may or may not be true. And we are assuming that uh, this is something we talked at the very beginning, even at the proposal stage of how incorporating the driver's behavior. And maybe we're going through the extremes and just picked acceleration right now. Because the main question is, if there's even this scenario, does it matter? And some of the results that we are seeing for these given um, values is it does at this given value. But now going back to how realistic this will be, then we'll have to, uh, I think we even discussed at the very early stage of uh, measuring actual driver's behavior for heavy duty what's actually happening, which could change the game and then even escalate when there's no driver and maybe the, the way they're navigating changes completely. Yep. Thank One you. more question, according to Asad. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anthony. Uh, in Europe, they have usually something, we call it the last lecture, the last lecture when people retire. Here, I'm going to call this the first lecture because this is the start of the taking off of Anjali. Uh, she did her master's and PhD and then uh, being the postdoc and research scientist with me. And I cannot be more proud and happier. Uh, this is why I called it the first lecture because that's your takeoff mm. for the next level of excellence at Arizona State University. Uh, Although we're going to miss you here, but uh, this is part of the mentoring program, and this is part of seeing our students go to the next level. So we're very, very happy. Uh, but also, this is the unique thing about Angeli that whenever there is uh, somebody could not make it, she's always filled in with the pleasure. So she's here today uh, in order to give us an amazing lecture. Uh, somebody couldn't make it. And she described what she uh, did as part of this project. I think this is this project fantastic way. So, Anjali, we love you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, so whenever I'm sad, I'm just going to go to YouTube and play this video. So, but <laughs> I appreciate it.